more restaurant talk. Uh, I am here with Sterling Douglas. He is the co-founder and CEO of Chowley. We're going to talk about how this whole pandemic is really impacting uh, restaurants sort of from the inside and an operational standpoint and sort of their tech stack um, point of view. But for Sterling, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Chowley does? Yeah, first, thanks for having me on, Chris. I, I appreciate it. Um, you know, now more than ever, um, talking about how off-premise can help restaurants is something I'm always happy to, uh, to be a part of. Um, but, you know, real quick on Chally, uh, we're basically a point of sale integration company. So we take orders from big third party marketplaces, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Postmates, um, over 150 of them. And we integrate those orders directly into a restaurant's point of sale system, uh, whether that be Aloha Micros um, or whether it be new systems like Toast or Revel, Square, Clover and all those. So if you're a restaurant, you sign up for four of these platforms, you get shipped four tablets uh, with Chally. We can help automate all those orders so they go directly into the point of sale system. Okay, because you're at the point of sale system right now, and because a lot of people are switching over to delivery, uh, what I'm wondering is, can you tell me, do you have any insights from data that you've uh, sort of put together in, in restaurants that you're working with right now? What have you noticed uh, in terms of ordering or ordering patterns, or what's something that people might be interested in knowing? Yeah, we've gotten asked this question uh, a lot over the past uh, couple of weeks, just in terms of how, how our consumer behavior is changing um, in kind of uh, this new world. Uh, a couple of things that we've noticed. One is that we've noticed a pretty strong link uh, in this interesting series of, of events that happens when a large market or a, um, or a state issues a shelter in place policy. Uh, what we'll see is the first day that the shelter in place is, is put on, uh, we'll see a dramatic drop in the, um, in the order volumes uh, that are coming through in those markets. Um, and then if you look at kind of social media and how it ties in, uh, you see a huge run on grocery stores in those markets mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Uh, and then anywhere from about four, five, six days after that initial shelter in place policy has been put in place, you start to see some of the order volumes come back up. And so it's been interesting to see that there's almost this dip where everyone loads up on groceries um, and a little bit of urgency and, and, and panic. Uh, and then they eat all their groceries and then after four or five days realize that maybe this isn't the end of the world and we could really use some takeout or delivery. Uh, so that's been one really interesting trend that we've noticed. And I wonder how that's gonna change too as there are more like just articles, newspaper, not newspaper, maybe I'm dating myself, but like uh, <laughs> online stories written from news sources, I should say. I'm thinking of like the Wall Street Journal uh, that ran a story not too long ago that are answering the question, is it safe to order delivery? I think we're getting that question answered more often in more sources so that people are coming in contact with it and thereby kind of understand a little bit more about what uh, what is entailed uh, with uh, grocery in, in terms of COVID. Um, so like right now, what are the things that restaurants should really be focusing on? If they need to make the move to delivery or obviously they need to make the move to delivery or takeout, what are some of the operational things or sort of the um, workflow things that they need to be thinking about in order to make that pivot? Yeah, so we've been dealing with a huge influx of new customers over the past few weeks. And a lot of these restaurants are getting into off-premise and, and delivery for the first time. Um, and they've kind of been forced into it uh, with a lot of the large markets like New York and Chicago, San Francisco, LA, with um, shelter in place and also on-premise restaurant um, orders being kind of banned. Uh, you see all of a sudden off-premise is kind of the lifeline. Um, so anytime that we're getting new customers um, that are coming to us and they're getting into off-premise for the first time, um, you know, the first thing that we always recommend them do is focus on their staff. Um, that's the first questions uh, that you ask. Um, it was the same thing that we did at Chowley. Uh, as soon as uh, shelter in place and, and things started getting really, um, you know, really, really real uh, in, in mid-March, that was the first thing that we did as a leadership team is we needed to figure out what we we're going to do with our staff and with our team um, and what positions they were in. So similar, uh, that's the first thing that a restaurant needs to do uh, when getting into off-premise for this because a lot of their staff may have uh, children uh, who are now home from school. Uh, and so they have to figure out like what that, that schedule looks like. Um, so that's kind of the first thing that we always recommend is, is look at the staff. Um, how, how are they going to support? What are the different hours going to be? And what other different types of adjustments uh, do you need to make uh, as a restaurant tour? So step one is really kind of like looking at your restaurant um, and looking at your your people first and kind of going from there. All right. 
And then in terms of like uh, workflow, so people are obviously, yes, they should take care of their people, right? But what about in terms of, you know, um, we've seen sort of this rise of restaurant software that, is, that has come up over the past years. Like, let me ask you this question. I'm going to broaden it a little mm -hmm. bit. What do you think the role of a software provider like yourself is at a time like this when restaurants are just getting hammered? You know, we see a lot of pitches from software startups that are saying, oh, we're waiving fees. We are, we're deferring whatever. And it seems like some of them a bit more mercenary than others. What do you, what do you see as your role as like a support mechanism for restaurants at a time when restaurants are having so little support in other places around them? Yeah, I, I mean, we're, restaurants are getting hit absolutely. Um, and it's a domino effect, right? And if restaurants get hit, it's all the people connected to them, whether that be on food distribution, um, whether that be a technology partner, whether that be marketing partners, catering partners, um, there's a huge domino effect. And, and I think that one of the cool things um, that, that I've seen kind of around the industry over the past few weeks is we've seen a lot of tech companies um, really actually band together um, and start kind of putting aside a lot of their heavily competitive natures and, and putting the restaurant first and thinking like, how can we support them? Um, so you see a lot of these uh, groups, whether they're doing, uh, you know, deferring fees, uh, groups are helping, uh, like technology companies are helping restaurants get started for the first time with certain technology platforms. Uh, if if I, if I think back to to what we when we were kind of going over what our strategy was going to be, um, after we figured out how to kind of support our staff and, and having them work remote, uh, the next part was like, all right, how are we going to help all these restaurants? Uh, we'd already see a huge uh, increase in our inbounds. Uh, requests for, for, for new customers of ours. Um, and we figured that the best thing that we could do for all these restaurants coming on board um, is, is waive our setup fees um, and then defer our first 60 days of fees. The idea being that now is a time where uh, a restaurant needs us the most. So how can we help them weather the storm? So if we can get them through the next 60 days of uncertainty, uh, that gives everybody kind of time to figure out what's going on. Uh, and we can kind of help support that off-premise uh, kind of revenue uh, cycle, uh, so to speak. Do you work with the more like independent delivery companies, right? Like, so they're the big ones, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Postmates, right? But mm -hmm. there are also these small ones where I, I live, I live in a pretty remote a rural area and we have a really small one that I don't think serves anywhere. I live on an island and no one else, it doesn't serve anywhere else. Otherwise the name Island Bites is a bit of a misnomer. But like <laughs> the, uh, so are you able to plug into those? Like, how do you manage that delivery marketplace? Because that's going to lead into my next question. So if you are an entrepreneurial person looking to help restaurants, like become a delivery service in an area, uh, like how connected are you to those smaller players? Yeah, so um, number one, in terms of uh, kind of independent operators, uh, over two thirds of our client base are uh, mom and pops, independent operators spread across the US. Uh, yes, we're in the big markets and we do the big marketplaces, uh, but we also do a lot of smaller markets and, and some of the smaller mar niche marketplaces. Uh, I don't know if we necessarily have island bites on our platform, but I can certainly double check. But we do integrate um, orders in, in Billings, Montana, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we work with some smaller groups. Melio uh, is, is a group out of Albany, New York that we work with. Um, and, and we have a handful spread across the country. Uh, so we do have kind of a wide ranging amount of support, whether you're in a big urban market or whether in one of the kind of the tertiary markets that are, are a bit more rural. Okay, because that leads me to the next thing, which is, you know, uh, restaurants are being encouraged to uh, switch to delivery and pickup, but delivery can come with a lot of onerous terms for a small restaurant, like big commissions that will eat into any money that they're able to eke out right now. So um, I guess my question is like, is there, What's a way for, what's a path forward for restaurants, especially smaller ones that aren't able to negotiate different terms with a DoorDash or an Uber Eats? How do they connect with these, these services, these, these smaller ones? And then, you know, uh, I, I don't know the, the method maybe being making them a preferred provider or whatever, but do you see what I'm saying? Like, uh, connect with these smaller mom and pop delivery services that are sort of in, in smaller pockets. Yeah, so this is uh, this actually leads in really well into kind of our, our, our step two that, that we talk to restaurants when they're new to off-premise. Um, so we talked about stuff on really just identifying your, your staff, your people, your restaurant. 
Uh, step two is a lot of like the logistics around this. How do I find the different third parties? Am I gonna do tablets? Am I gonna do integration? Where is the food gonna stand? Do I have a heating lamp? Where are drivers going to wait? I can't have them waiting inside uh, the restaurant. Um, so there's all these logistical questions um, that really need to be answered as, as kind of the next step. Uh, and what, what, what Chowley can help with, um, you know, we can help get the orders integrated. We can help tell you which groups are serviceable in your area. Um, and along that side, one of the things that we've always talked to restaurants a ton about was to think very, very hard about what menu you are going to put on your third party marketplaces. The menu that you may have in store or that you may have on your direct ordering website, uh, that does not necessarily need to be the same menu that you have on your third party marketplaces. Make sure you, you pick items that are potentially have higher gross margins. So ones with lower food costs, make sure those ones are on uh, the, the third party marketplaces. Um, make sure that you have that, that menu that's a little bit simpler. Uh, we see tons of, of restaurants that want to try to offer every single customization of every single item on their menu. Uh, and the fact is on the third party marketplaces, uh, the menus that perform better and convert more customers are much simpler. Uh, it's less modifications. Uh, it's more simpler items, well-written descriptions. Um, so having a limited menu uh, is, is number one. And to hit on your point on, on the, how to handle the commissions, that will help. Right, if you kind of pick out your, yeah. your higher gross margin items, but in addition, um, you know, having higher priced items on the third party marketplaces is okay. Um, it's certainly not ideal from the third party marketplace perspective, uh, but it is helpful to restaurants, especially ones that maybe in specially low margins or be getting into the third party marketplaces for the first time. And that's the other thing that we always suggest is kind of part of that step too. All right, you, you're on Grubhub, Uber Eats, Dredge, and Postmates. That's great, um, but you need to make sure you have your own direct channel. Um, so we work with a ton of those groups as well. Um, you know, I was just talking with uh, Zuppler as, 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 a, as a white label online ordering group earlier today. Um, there are a lot of options in the market, whether it be Chow Now um, or uh, Go Parrot is another one. Uh, there's a handful of these, and we always encourage all of our restaurants to make sure that they have that channel as well. Um, so there's, there's this whole kind of digital journey that restaurants go on, and we're trying to compress um, a lot of these actions into very quick steps uh, given the current circumstances. Okay, so with that, have you noticed any data in terms of what uh, 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 most, like uh, um, the best number of menu items to have? I realize that that may be different, right? Like a pizza is going to be different than hamburger, right? So there's probably a certain amount of toppings, but I don't know if you've seen any sort of generalities in terms of if you offer more than X number of items on a menu on a third party delivery, your orders drop off X percent. Yeah. The biggest impact that we've seen in terms of optimizing menus for conversion rates, uh, there's not a huge drop off after a certain amount of items. Um, there's a, the drop off, the real impactful ones really come on the amount of modifiers that are placed on an individual one item. Um, a, an item that's just called Chicago style hot dog uh, will be ordered more often than an item that is hot dog. And then you have to select the different modifiers, whether it be Chicago style, chili cheese, um plain or, or etc so it's more about just kind of the structure of the menu when you can have more men more menu items um to help with seo uh and then less modifiers to help pre prevent what's called decision paralysis uh which is what consumers get when they have too many choices um, yeah and i can so, imagine yeah. that at some point consumers in their you know they're scared they're hunkered down somebody just make a decision for me just like hey just don't make me choose between the chili cheese dog and the Chicago style hot dog. Just say, Hey, there's, here's a hot dog. And that yeah. sort of takes, I can imagine that relieving a little bit of pressure off it. Have you seen any, any companies really experimenting with purple pricing in terms of like driving demand and off peak hours? Um, I, I think that probably earlier we did in, in kind of this new world, um, the normal hours have shifted. Um, so everyone's trying to figure out what that new normal is. Um, we see Sunday used to be the king of ordering uh, of days of the week. Uh, really? did, more, did more orders on Saturday, did more orders on Friday. Uh, it's been true since the, the beginning of, of Chowley, um, whether when we were just mostly an independent operators, when we had a heavy amount of pizza on the platform. Uh, as, as we've grown, we've, we've gotten really diversified there. Um, and, and we've really seen a shift over the past three weeks um, to Friday and Saturdays, particularly Friday night and Saturday night. So we see a ton more order volume coming through during those times. And these are the times where people used to go out 
the two restaurants mm. to go out. This is this was date night. Uh, this was you know going with your friends, and so people still want that experience, um, and they're trying to figure out ways to have it at home. And, and delivery is is a great way to do that. Um, so we've seen a ton of increase in a lot of those Sunday orders. Um, really start shifting into more of the Friday and Saturday, and in addition to that, you have during the week, there used to be this huge lunch uh, ordering volumes that we'd see in New York, San Francisco, Chicago. Um, and we've definitely seen those drop a lot as well. So the whole hours thing has completely changed. And I think we're still trying to figure out uh, what the new tendencies are from that perspective. I guess that actually makes a lot of sense because you're not dealing in a confined physical space where you have you know, 300 people trying to order from the same three people right? They're all at home and ordering at different times and you're able to stagger that and batch them together for delivery in different ways. Um, we got a question from the audience. I'm going to start here. So uh, this is sort of a, um, the question is just, is it sustainable for tech companies? Which is a little, uh, I'm going to probably put a little spin on this one, which is, okay, so you're a tech company, right? Um, there are lots of software, uh, as we said, a lot of software companies for restaurants out there. But um, I guess, are we looking at another like dot com bust for software companies? And I guess your answer is a little biased because you're in a software company, <laughs> right? So you're going to say like everything's great. But having said that, right, like what keeps you up at night in terms of what's happening here? Uh, I mean, the, the thing that always keeps me up is is uh, is always our staff. One of the things, one of the challenges that we've been working through is uh, we've gotten a, an amazing increase in in new uh, business coming our way, and these are restaurants that are borderline desperate to get off premise going, uh, and, and we're a key piece of infrastructure um, to support this this new revenue line. So for us, we have been um, working nights, weekends, every hour that we can to help get as many of these restaurants uh, on board as we can because we know how important it is to them. And we view it as our responsibility uh, to make sure that we treat it with the same urgency that they are because in a lot of cases, their businesses are really uh, on the line here. Uh, and so that's something that we've been really working hard. So I constantly think about our team and our, and our staff making sure that we can keep up and still provide a really great service um, you know, for these restaurants and for us, you know, we had this big influx that actually triggered a, a different emotion from us. I know a lot of tech companies are doing layoffs right now. Um, we're kind of the opposite. We've actually been hiring uh, people over the last few weeks uh, to basically help keep up with this man and help, you know, continuing providing good service to our clients. Um, so is it sustainable? Um, I mean, you, you can look at what companies are going to um, emerge from this, you know, with uh, somewhat increased amounts of business, and you're going to see a lot of them most of them that actually merge from it with less business. Um, so I, I hope that helps. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. No. So what I do you facilitate also like takeout, carry out food, or are you mainly? Uh, okay. So yes, you're nodding. So yes, you do. <laughs> because one of the things we've heard right is that the best way to support a restaurant isn't to order a delivery, but it's to do takeout. Um, but that requires a different sort of um, workflow as well, right? Like it's mm -hmm. not. So um, what are some things restaurants should know in terms of setting up those different processes? Is there anything, any advice you can give to them as they're looking to not only, you know, because everybody needs to get cash where they can. Everybody needs to get mm -hmm. revenue where they can, right? And if it's, that's delivery, that's one set of issues. And if it's takeout, that's another. And so what have you, in your experience in helping people set up, what have you learned from both of those? Uh, yeah, so most of the third parties will help pick up most of the direct, uh, kind of the white labeled online ordering will do pick up. Um, a lot of point of sale companies have their own online ordering solution um, that's kind of like automatically built in, um, in into kind of the point of sale. And those always have pick up optionality. Um, for a restaurant, a pickup order is always going to be uh, a higher margin order than a delivery order um, because you don't have to, um, you know, fulfill the actual delivery, which is, is a costly endeavor. Uh, so yeah, doing pickup and delivery, those are two huge parts of, of the off-premise strategy. Uh, and so we definitely push all of our clients to do both of those, uh, not just delivery. And, and, and going back to the other question, is there a sort of an optimization in terms of menuing um, across the three? So uh, the idea of option paralysis, I think is really interesting, yeah. especially if, if you think about somebody ordering something on their phone. 
right? Mm -hmm. And having to scroll through, they don't want to scroll through 10 million different items, but they want to scroll through it. They, they, they just want to order food, right? And they want to order the food that they want. So uh, have you seen anything in terms of that with like, is there a, a different set of considerations to create a, your takeout menu? Yeah, so for the most part, we see kind of off-premise menus um, being supported uh, as like pretty parallel, um, whether it be menus or processes. If you think about what an Uber Eats delivery is from the restaurant's perspective, it is feels very similar to a pickup order. Um, if the restaurant does not have its own driver and is not fulfilling the order itself, uh, that means a customer is driving to the store and picking up the order the same way that an Uber driver would drive to the store and pick up the order. Uh, so we see a lot of parallels in terms of what a pickup uh, order looks like for a delivery order, unless you actually have your own drivers that you're dispatching, um, in which case that's where you see kind of a, a little bit more divergence in, in the strategies. All right. We got another question here from the audience. So um, how much of Chowley's new COVID-19 driven business do you think is sustainable long-term? So how many are gonna stick with you six months from now, do you think? And Man. don't say all of them. <laughs> I, I hope as many as possible. Um, I don't. I don't pretend to have a crystal ball and, and know exactly uh, when things go back to normal or or how many restaurants come back. Um, you know, we view a lot of that response package as us doing right by the industry that supports us. Um, and so, for us, if there's a restaurant that uses us for the 60 days um, and then you know leaves us there, so they don't have to pay us anything, but we helped get them through that time of uncertainty, so they could figure things out. Um, you know, we, we will chalk that up as doing the right thing for the industry um, and really helping it move forward. Okay, so I know you spoke earlier about like getting, uh, taking care of your people, but let's say that, you know, we've got more than 1300 people in this virtual summit, which is fantastic. I imagine, you know, we may have different levels of operators there. If you're a small operator who's just been caught off guard by all of this and are looking to make a transition so that you can survive this pandemic, what are what are the things you should be doing now? Like, what are the what are the really nuts and bolts kinds of things that they should be doing? Yeah, I think after you've taken a look at at your staff, you've figured out your hours, um, you've got a good idea of what your menus look like for off premise. Um, after that, it's it's how quickly can you get onto these platforms? The nice thing about getting uh, Grubhub, Uber Eats, storage process is that you can get up and going really fast. Um, and so when we think about a lot of our restaurants' digital journeys, uh, they typically start with those third-party marketplaces. Uh, then the first thing that we encourage them to do is to make sure that they have their own direct channel um, so that their loyal, their loyal customers, their frequent ones who want to order direct, have a way to do that where the restaurant doesn't have to pay a large commission. They can just be kind of absorbed into a flat monthly fee that most of the direct online ordering providers have. Um, after that, you, you've kind of tailored your menu. You've got your own direct channel. Then, then you start moving into kind of this, what we call kind of like this expertise phase. Um, and that's where we see restaurants doing a lot more experimentation around uh, virtual concepts, different pop-ups. If you have a restaurant, you can take subsections of your menu, spin up a virtual concept, uh, have it on the different third-party platforms, have a direct way to order as well. Uh, and that's another way that you can help add like incremental sales out of your same brick and mortar location. So, and after virtual restaurants, there's a couple other uh, things you can start uh, blending in your own loyalty programs. So you can start doing your own marketing. Uh, you can start dispatching uh, drivers using kind of DoorDash Drive, Postmates Fleet, um, local courier services to help support it. Uh, there's this whole list of kind of things you can do to really enhance both your, your, your digital and your off-premise um, initiatives. Um, but usually, uh, most of the restaurants today, we are trying to get them started and just get the revenue coming in, get the orders coming in first and forth. Okay, you know, the interesting is that, uh, I wonder if you have any data or any insights you can share about like the virtual concept, right? Uh, that idea has been around for a few years now, but people may be considering it more than before. Have you noticed anything in terms of the number of, either the number of virtual concepts that are being created or what you're seeing successful virtual concept conversions doing? Um, I mean, it's all over the board. Um, it, it, it really depends. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of like very particular data uh, that helps really determine how successful these virtual concepts are going to be. Um, so there may be a zip code where 
uh, people keep searching for healthy food and salads, uh, but there might not be a lot of healthy or salad based restaurants. And so if you are a restaurant in that area and you have a subsection of your menu for salads, and then you spin up a virtual concept uh, that can help take advantage uh, of that. And that way, when people search for salads, they now believe they're interacting with a place that really specializes in it. Um, we, we've seen crazy order volumes there. We, we've seen places that in a virtual restaurant can do over 100 orders a day if they're in the right place and they have the right menu, right? Um, but we also see a ton of people just kind of spreading and trying to start any virtual concept they can think of. Well, I have grilled cheese on my menu, so let's spin up a grilled cheese. People love, you know, uh, ordering grilled cheese late at night and it can have, you know, a couple orders a day. Uh, so it, it really varies and it depends a lot on really kind of indexing uh, the right search criteria for uh, that region. Is there any way for people to access that data, right? Like, cause I know Uber Eats would wanna keep that pretty close to the, as they spin up their own virtual concepts, right? They're gonna, they're not gonna go like, oh, you know, you should do this unless they're getting, you know, they're getting a taste of it. Um, so I don't know if there are other resources people can look at to try and see where that Venn diagram might be of people searching and their capabilities. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, in my, in my experience, if you're a restaurant and you've reached out directly you know, to, to Grubhub, so I want to do some virtual uh, concepts, uh, depending on the area you're in, we've seen them work together on, um, on helping those. They did a big partnership with Let Us Entertain You uh, here in Chicago and Whole30. Um, and they kind of worked in tandem, uh, a lot of Let Us Entertain You to, to operate the, the restaurants. Um, and then Grubhub kind of like helped, you know, stand them up on online ordering, help uh, present them to a huge customer base. Um, so I, I don't know of any public places where that data is available, um, but I know the third parties will will help and, and will work with that um, as you're spinning up restaurants on their sites. Okay, right. Y yeah, that's that's what I was trying to, I was trying to avoid sort of the concept of lock-in with a particular vendor because like the beauty well you know the the whole premise of chowley is being able to connect you with a lot of different mm -hmm. you know delivery services to maximize and to your point before which is that you know this is um uh, i hate to use this term, but it's like it's really it, restaurant operators need to do stuff now to get revenue they need to really you know get it where they can in order to stay afloat and so uh not wanting to shut off valves but really see uh, you know how many mm -hmm. other open ones that they can create uh so in our final minutes here i'm just wondering you know for you what do you see uh it's really hard it's it's it's, it's almost impossible to sort of prognosticate right so i can't ask the question the typical closer like oh where is chowley a year from now right <laughs> but maybe you can tell you know what do you think is going to come of all this in terms of just the restaurant industry in general? Uh, I think that this shortened a lot of timelines. I, I think a lot of restaurants have that on their six to 12 month to-do list um, to make sure that their digital and off-premise strategies um, are really going into place. And I think this has um, completely wrecked those timelines. Um, and it's either we're not doing it at all because uh, we're closing temporarily, or it's we need it now. Um, and so for us, it's trying to uh, react as quickly as our clients are um, and make sure that we can help them. Because our our whole vision of, of Chowley is to really help restaurants, um, whether you be an independent operator, of, uh, a mom and pop that owns one or two locations, um, or a thousand plus location chain, um, you know, we want to help on the off-premise and this digital journey that restaurants are going on. And so what we're seeing now is a lot more accelerated timelines into getting into that. Um, and so for us, we want to try to make sure that we do our part um, and we try to help as many restaurants get started and, and get some of these kind of the bones and the infrastructure in place so that they can do uh, this digital and off-premise strategy uh, that they all of a sudden need today. Awesome. And that is a great place to end this. Sterling Douglas, co-founder and CEO of Chowley, thank you so much for being a part of today's summit. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris.